Hello. Steve from Southern Illinois. Sorry I missed last week. It's been a rugged two weeks. Um, stomach bugs going through Vivian and I and uh, keeping us occupied. The story that I want to share with you today happened back in 2000, so 20 years old, but it's still fresh in my mind, okay? Uh, we'd be, we had the privilege of working in Nigeria, in central Nigeria, and um, after about three months there, I felt like I was getting the hang of things, uh, learning the new diseases, how to navigate the new health systems. And one day I was in the clinic and we had finished a busy day and I overheard the nurse say, man, it's a shame all of these malnourished children that we see every day. And it got my attention because I'd seen probably 30, 40 children that day and I hadn't diagnosed malnourished once. And so as I did many times in Nigeria, I adopted the role of a child. I went to the nurse and I said, you talked about malnourished children today. Tell me what you were seeing, teach me. And so she, talked, she taught me the signs of malnourishment that were so common in the children there. Uh, puffy arms and faces, uh, dry scaly skin, hair that had straightened and taken on a reddish tinge. In medical terms, this is called kwashiorkor, which is a sign of deficiency of not enough protein in the diet for the child or and uh, other nutritional deficiencies. And once she pointed it out to me, I saw it everywhere. Now here in the United States, I had only seen kwashiorkor once. And that was in a, the neglected child of two alcoholic parents who, who were feeding their baby beer in the bottle, okay? Uh, I had, I, I, it was not even on my radar. Here in America, we don't look for kwashiorkor. But in the rest of the world, in the developing work world, kwashiorkor is very common in Africa. It has its own name, not kwashiorkor. It's called weaning disease because children, as long as they're on their breath, on the breast, are getting all of the nutrition that they need most of the time. But once they're weaned, they're very vulnerable because the diet that most people eat in developing countries is very high in carbohydrates. Grains are the staple of every culture and uh, poor, the poor people and the not so poor people eat diets that are heavy in carbohydrates and for children that doesn't provide adequate nutrition. And so these children would, would be weaned and then they would start developing these signs of weaning disease Well, once I recognized what the problem was, I realized that in the hospital, 90% of our children were malnourished. We were diagnosing and treating pneumonia. We were diagnosing and treating malaria, various other diseases. But underneath of all of that was malnourishment. <clears throat> and children dying in the hospital is not an uncommon event in the developing world. Here in the United States, if a child dies, something went wrong. It doesn't happen. But in the developing world, children die all the time. And uh, as I experienced over the next several weeks there in the hospital, children dying, I realized that maybe the fact that we were not addressing their malnutrition was having an impact. And one day we had three children die that morning. And I came home 
and I walked into the kitchen and I did a very, very mature thing for a male. Okay, I stomped my foot and I said, Wife, I am tired of watching children die. Fix it. And she and I had had some conversations about the malnutrition in the children. She knew what I was talking about. But she looked at me and she said, Steve, I raised my, my children on Gerber and Beechnut. What do I know about feeding children? Now, for those of you in, in the rest of the world, Gerber and Beechnut are brand names for baby food, the, the, the prepared foods that we feed our children here in the United States after we wean them. Okay, she had, She'd had these prepared foods that were nutritionally balanced that she gave her children. She had no idea how to make baby food from scratch. Thankfully, we had a friend friend there that day, and Rhoda said, well, I know how to do that. It turned out that there had been a grant-supported program 20 years earlier teaching people how to do this, and she had been one of the trainers. And so she taught Vivian how to, how to make PAP, okay, and that's a, a, a gruel, a thin mush, um, uh, and to fortify it with with peanuts and soybeans. And the ratio had been worked out so that it was tolerable for the children. And so from that day on, every morning and every evening, Vivian and Rhoda would make a big pot of pap, carry it over to the hospital, and each child and mother combo would get one cup of this fortified pap. What difference does one cup twice a day make? Well, within four days, we were no longer ch losing children. Now, that's not a scientific study. That's just my experience. And the rate of death in the children seemed to drop precipitously. Even more dramatic when I saw those same children back in clinic for aftercare, that red straightened hair, within two weeks it had disappeared and they had black curly hair. They were no longer puffy in their arms and in their face. Their skin had straightened. Two weeks of one cup in the morning and one cup in the evening and their health had improved dramatically. They no longer had weaning disease. The powerful impact that this could have was emphasized a, a couple of, of weeks later. We did an outreach clinic in, in, a, in an outlying village. It was far removed from the main roads, okay? And we were holding a clinic there. There was almost no health care in the area. And this mother came in and she said, in our home there are two wives. Polygamy was common in our area there. There are two wives, and we have had five children, and all of them have died from weaning disease. My child now is the sixth child in the family, and we weaned him two months ago, and now he has weaning disease. Can you help us? Now, by help, she was coming to me wanting a pill or a shot, some medicine, to heal the weaning disease because if you went to the pharmacist, the chemist, um, as they were, they're called there, um, they would give you pills for weaning disease. I had the nurse explain the fortified pap and you could just see the skepticism and the disbelief on the, on the woman's face as to what was going on. What do you mean all I have to do is put peanuts and soybeans into the pap? That's not going to fix the problem. I need a shot. I need a pill. I need something powerful. Food is not powerful. And yet that was the answer. Now at that same outreach clinic, the pastor of the church that we were holding the clinic in was listening. And he was hearing what we were saying. 
The next week he went to visit his brother who was a health worker in another village. Uh, and as he was waiting for his brother to finish seeing patients, he was sitting in the waiting area and he noticed all of these children with weaning disease in the waiting room. And he started going around to the mothers and teaching them about the pap. And some of the village elder elders were sitting in the waiting room and they said, are you a doctor? He said, no, I'm a pastor. Then what are you doing? I'm sharing. I'm sharing good news. Weaning disease does not have to kill our children. They said, but you're not giving any pills. You're not. Pills aren't the answer. Food is the answer. And it's a simple solution. All of the ingredients are in your homes right now. We just don't know how to use them. Well, those same village elders went back to their village and held a discussion. And they decided, you know what, this is, a, this is simple. And if it really is as powerful as they say, why are we letting our children die in our village? And so the village elders taught all of the mothers in their village how to make this fortified pap. Two months later, they came to that same pastor and they said, we have eradicated weaning disease from our village. What else do you have to teach us to help us make our people's lives better? You know, in Nigeria, I was an outsider. I was experiencing everything new. I could adopt the role. I had the perspective of a child. Everything was an adventure. I learned a lot there. And one of the most powerful things I learned was how important nutrition is. When I came back to the United States the next year, <clears throat> I was looking for blind spots. Because you see, that was what we ran into in Nigeria. This aspect of nutrition was a blind spot in their culture, and as a consequence, weaning disease was very common. But once they recognized the blind spot, weaning disease almost disappeared. What blind spots do we have in our culture? That was the question I was asking myself as I came back to the United States, where I could get a CAT scan within an hour where I could get an MRI within a couple of days, all of these technological tools, all of these powerful medications. <coughs> what blind spots do we have? And I was seeing diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, heart disease, strokes. All of these have significant nutritional components. All of them are tied to the way we live our lives and the way we eat. Now as Christians, one of the things that we emphasize is the freedom that we have in Christ. That His grace is what saves us, not our keeping of rules. And that freedom is something that we really emphasize and is important to us. So much to the fact, so much in fact, that we almost go to the opposite extreme as to teach that there are no rules, that there is nothing that we need to do. And anybody who imposes rules on us is a legalist who is imposing on our freedom. And yes, that's the root, one of the roots, for why freedom is so important in discussions about COVID. But you know what? While freedom is very real and is a very real issue, the way we live our lives is very real too. When I came back to the United States and I recognized these blind spots that we have in our culture, 
the high fat diet, the high meat content in our diet, the 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 way we eat refined foods instead of foods as grown. Okay, all of these aspects directly impact our health. And I started sharing this with my patients and when I was asked to give mission stories in churches, I'd share it in churches as I was telling about my Nigeria experience. But I kept running into these roadblocks. You know, people saying, well, food's important, but not that important, okay? You can't cure diabetes with diet. You can't cure heart disease with diet. Now, both statements are wrong, by the way, okay? You can't cure either disease, but you can control it. And you can control it as easily with diet as you can with medications, in many cases. But one of the one of the most telling experiences for me, I had been sharing this with with a church, and I at the end of the church service, um, people were coming up to me and sharing their counter stories and thanking me. And one gentleman came up, and he said. Well, I'm very glad that you finally got to the important stuff at the end of your talk, because all of that talk about health and food, all of those things, those things are meaningless. All that matters is that we have faith in Jesus Christ, and He will save us. And I'm afraid my jaw dropped, and I didn't know what to say. It wasn't just because he was sitting there in a wheelchair, having had an amputation of a foot because of his diabetes and his obesity. It was this whole mindset that my life is mine to live. I am free to do what I want with my body. It's as if we as Christians are willfully ignorant of the fact that Paul says, your body is not your own. It is Christ's. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Friends, how we live our lives says more about our relationship with God than our words. This touchstone our bodies being the temple of God, our bodies being bought by a, with a price and belonging to God, and the way we care for our bodies is a, is a witness of our relationship with God. This principle was a touchstone throughout the Bible. Now in the Old Testament, it is expressed in specific rules. Eat this, don't eat that. Do this, don't do that. In the New Testament, it's expressed clearly our bodies are the temple of God they belong to God we are merely stewards of our bodies which ties us back to our last talk about stewardship many of the people that I ex came into contact with in Nigeria experienced the power the good news of health of taking care of our bodies, of caring for our bodies as if they are a gift given us by the God we worship. So friends, let me ask you this. Do you honor God in your body? Does your spiritual life include caring for yourself? Have a good week, friends. Be safe. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I hope to see you next week.